as we come to communion, I just thought to talk a little bit about a word, a prophetic word I got a couple of weeks ago, which I managed to speak out in church. And it, was a, it started with a word of knowledge that there were people in the room that were very hungry for God. And I found myself declaring, God feeds the hungry. And I thought about that and I went through you know, some scriptures and I, it really is true, he does feed the hungry. <laughs> in, the, in the wilderness when the, people were, the children of Israel were wandering, he fed them manna. When Elijah had to run away, to the brook and hide, he commanded the ravens to feed him. And <clears throat> Jesus himself was hungry and he fed the 5,000 and he fed the 4,000 by way of a miracle. And it says when he saw the people out there in the wilderness, he had compassion on them. And I just feel like that speaks of, of his heart, God's heart about people who are hungry. And in the Beatitudes, Jesus said, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satiated. No, they'll be filled. <clears throat> and lastly, Jesus was on the beach when the disciples were out fishing. He was on the beach cook, cooking them breakfast and he fed them. He also had a talk with Peter and he said, do you love me three times? And he said, feed my lambs. So it's really important. I felt in that prophetic word that, that hunger for God draws the spirit of God in that there's a certainty. God created us. It's a metaphor. God created us to have hunger. I, I looked a little bit at appetite and how incredibly complex the regulation of our appetite is and that can become dysregulated if we click it off we want to get skinny or or sometimes when people are, are chronically and seriously ill they switch off their appetite and um, I, I, I know if, um, I know for me I, I when I was working I couldn't I couldn't afford to be hungry because there was <laughs> If there were two or three patients waiting in the waiting room, I just had to <laughs> forget about it and just keep working. So you can. You can control it. I think you can control spiritual hunger too. I think you can replace it with things like social media or different things. But I think Jesus says, my flesh is real blood and my is my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink. So there's a spiritual intake. There's a spiritual transaction. And so let's think about that. Let's re I think it's a wonderful thing that God wants to feed us, both spiritually and physically. And I know this Christian life isn't easy sometimes. You do get drained there's all, you just sit, feel like you get over one battle and then the next one starts and you, and you do need to rep, replenish yourself. I remember finishing work and being so starving and hardly having the energy to walk to my car. And then I just feel like we, we, the Lord doesn't want us to be like that. He wants us to be well nourished spiritually so that we're prepared. So let's think about that as we take our communion.
I think you see there, we come to Pentecost Sunday. Now I'm sitting here and I remember that um, I went through a season where I spoke at a lot of places, right? And one of the places I spoke at was a, um, uh, I spoke at Our Lady Queen of Peace Church at Greystones. Which, were, which was where the Catholic Charismatic Renewal had their annual, annual gathering. And so I don't know. There would have been six or 800 people that go, you know. I remember the first time I went on the stage was um, the cardinal, a few bishops, lots of priests, and there were all the combined prayer meetings of Sydney, the Catholic charismatic prayer groups were there. And I went and I was on a, a prayer team. That's where I made my debut with Tanya, on a prayer team uh, in the corner. And we first prayed for this lady who spoke to us in a man's voice. <laughs> and... <laughs> And I said, shut up and come out of her. And she fell on the ground and was delivered. Can you say amen? And uh, so I was trained. I was trained because the leader of the church I was in at that time, I'd seen him do it one week before. He prayed somewhere and I was like, carried his bag and a woman spoke to him in a man's voice and he said, shut up and come out. And that's what happened. But what happened there It was celebrating Pentecostal, a Pentecost Sunday. And one of the things about the Catholics that I had been in contact with is they valued the gift of tongues. Catholic, Catholic uh, charismatics are tongue-talking people. And uh, uh, so we're there. The presence of God came on me while I'm in that meeting and while I'm there, the church was like a fan shape and I'm standing there giving the teaching and I could see a huge wave coming up out the back <coughs> and God said to me, I'm about to drench these people and I saw the wave come and like dozens and dozens, I don't know how many, but lots of people just fell over. Uh, and um, and th that began a season of my life where when I walked past people, they fell over without, without prayer. And, and I mean really slain in the spirit. I don't mean like a courtesy fall and then jump up. No, nah, gone. Gonski, carry them out. And I'm, th I'm thinking of that today and... Um, uh, and I'm thinking about where I've come and where the Father's house has come and where, what are we meant to be doing? Because we're celebrating the coming of Pentecost today. And liturgical churches break the years up into different seasons, okay? And really, if you go to a charismatic church, they know it's Pentecost Sunday because the denominational churches have been faithful to keeping that liturgical calendar. Otherwise, you go to the average Pentecost, they wouldn't know what day it was. It's just another day to worship God. It was, they don't necessarily put any significance on it. So when we want to move with the Spirit of God, there's an inner dying to self that has to take place so that God is living big in us and he flows out of us. There's a divine flow. And many years ago, I, um, the, um, jo John Osteen, the father of Joel Osteen, came to Australia and he preached a message on the divine flow, which was life-changing for me. 
and he talked about me being in a place where I would let God flow through me and bless people from the overflow. So that if I was moved, Colleen, by compassion, it was the Spirit of God moving me. Because before I received the Spirit of God, I was never moved by compassion. I was moved by boredom. I was moved by jealousy. I was moved by a whole lot of things, but I wasn't moved by compassion. And, um, and so began this journey. And I find myself in places and I've got, I've got my beloved wife with me. My wife could have picked every song tonight. She just loved them. She loved the songs tonight. Why? The line of Judah was in them. That's a start. Anything with gates in it, lions in it, anything like that, she's into it. So I don't have to think if she if she died before me, I could pick the songs of her funeral in five minutes. I would. I could. I'm not going to tell you what they are because I'm not going to preempt anything happening. But I'm just saying, saying I knew. I knew from the minute we started to sing, she was into it. And I I think to myself, I I I come into this experience and it's and it's really weird. It's weird stuff. And if you want to flow in the spirit of God, you're gonna lose control. Because you're not gonna tell God what to do. He's going to tell you what to do. And if you want to flow in God, you've got to do what he tells you. And you can't tell him it's not an appropriate time. You can't tell him it's inconvenient to you. You can't tell him you're going to be embarrassed about what people are going to think about you. Who cares what people think really? Those who love you, what they think can be important to you. But you can't let people, you know, you can't let people sort of determine how you're going to respond to God. And Sunday mornings I watched the show called The Outsiders, which is um, people... Rebelling against wokeism, and 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 they're not they're not so well put together either. So, so I, I'm just sort of saying, people are telling me I should vote, vote for the Voice. Okay, I'm not telling you what I'm going to vote. I have maybe mine. I don't even know what it is, but I know that people are really angry about it, and. Uh, and, and and people are expressing their view. And the latest offering this morning was showing me the row, uh, the outpouring of gender neutral clothing for little kids. Oh, beloved, this is this is like putting our kids on the altar of sacrifice. It's evil as evil. And the people are not even embarrassed about it. And we're too embarrassed to say anything or we're too safe to say anything. But when you see a baby romper suit which is saying, I've come out, or, or, or you see a baby romper suit which is saying it's good to be gay, beloved, that's the judgment street that the world will go down and pay such a price for that. Because what God had against Moloch was and what he had against people were when they started to sacrifice their children to idols. And when they started to sacrifice themselves, sacrifice their children to idols, the judgment of God came upon came upon Moab. God's going to find no Moab in me. I'm not a Moabite. And I have no... And I watched this morning 
They've got little fashion parades with kids wearing the gay rainbow clothes and all of this. I think to myself, are we crazy? We have ceased to fear God and his judgment. We've ceased to let it impact us. And we're more concerned about what people are going to think of us. Are you reading your Bible? Are you allowing the Word of God to change you and reframe you and get you ready? Are you ready for the divine flow? I sit at home and and I really agonise about what I'm going to talk about when I come here. Of course, it's like I just repeat what I've said over the years and try and say it a different way or whatever. And I'm not here to be popular. I'm not. And, and, and I'm not here for you to like me. I, 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 I hope you do, but if you don't, I, I'll have to survive. But when I see gay slogans on little babies' romper suits, you say to yourself, whole sections of Target and stuff like that with, with these clothes in it. With the fact now, in Victoria, they're having drag queens come into the libraries to read stories to children. There's a lot of stories, right? For example, if someone is gender challenged themselves, right? And they're struggling with their sexual identity that's a hard journey to be on. That's a hard journey. And I've had a lot to do with people who have had sexual struggles and it's not an easy place to be in. And they need, com- they need compassion, they need empathy, but they don't need our agreement. They don't need our judgment They don't need our vilification, but they don't need us to be buying tickets to the show. And and because if you buy, all of a sudden, I'm, um, I'm in the wrong because I think men are men and women are women. Hello? I'm not taking it on myself. I've got seven children, 22 grandchildren, five or six great-grandchildren, you know. And, and, and I've had my struggles. See, I've struggled with mental illness. You don't get through this world without any, any crosses to bear. Jesus said if we want to follow him, we're going to have to deny ourselves take up our cross and follow him. And sometimes the crosses are very heavy. I know people in this room who've carried heavy crosses. But to sort of, to sort of say, we're just going to let it go, I'm sitting there today and I'm praying and I thank God for the gift of tongues which to me is the evidence of baptism in the Spirit. If you're baptised in the Spirit of God, you pray in tongues. That's the evidence. And, and when I got the gift of tongues, I found that that's another story which has been told a lot of times, but the reality is when I got the gift of tongues, It's the doorway to the power. It's the doorway to a deep and meaningful spirituality. And if you've been given that gift and you are not exercising it, I want to give you a reminder call on Pentecost Sunday. I want to say to you, this is why Jesus came. And I remember I was at, I lived at Emu Heights, Tanya and I, and we did what we call a Life in the Spirit seminar. So... That was a Catholic way of entering people into a life in the spirit. There'd be 
uh, a five-week program. They'd talk about salvation. They'd talk about how to receive God's gift. They'd talk about repentance. And then they'd have a night when they would pray for the gift of tongues. Well, I didn't get it there. I got the gift of tongues in my bath. And as I was able, as I really cried out to God. And, um, but I, I was at there and, you know, when you got the gift of tongues often, you'd sort of say, you'd pull yourself up and you'd think, you said, what am I doing this rubbish for? What am I making these rubbish sounds for? So I'm there and uh, I'm in uh, uh, Emu Heights Public School and I'm there, one of the guys there is on setting chairs up and doing all that stuff. And I'm sitting in front of a, I'm sitting in front of a woman with a, a friend of mine and we're praying in tongues and his tongue changes. And the woman behind grabbed him and said, when did you learn to speak Russian? And he was speaking to her, singing a hymn that her mother sang to her when she's a baby. I mean, what do you do with that? I was with the same guy. He started to sing in a different tongue. And the, the woman behind him said, when did you learn Italian? He's speaking Italian, he's singing praises to God in Italian. I'm at Emu Heights, we were renting acres, and Tanya and I, um, a couple came and she was a Jewess. And we were praying in tongues, Tanya and I, and maybe one other person, I can't remember. John, yeah. So we're praying in tongues. And you know what we're praying to her? A Jewess? The prayers that Jesus prayed to the woman at the well, if only you knew who it was who was offering you water today. Now these are being allowing the Spirit of God to flow through you. He does the divine. He does the miraculous. And we become a channel. Francis of Assisi said, make me a channel of your peace. Where there's hatred, let me show love. And talked about, O Divine divine Master, grant that I might only seek not to be consoled but to console. The words of the ancients reverberating through our body. People who have learnt to spend hours and hours alone with God. And I say that because the basis of, Of my own faith, the way I came was the scripture from Acts 2.42 where it says that they were faithful to the apostles' teaching, to prayer, to the breaking of bread and to the fellowship, the koinonia. The elements of a healthy church, the elements that we should be trying to achieve in our own life. And... And... uh, I've always been radical because the gospel is radical. They haven't always liked me and they hadn't liked Jesus either because they finally had to kill him, didn't they? They couldn't stand his message of mercy. They couldn't stand his his stand against the establishment. They couldn't stand that he turned over all the money-making ventures in the temple. We have become, the church of Jesus Christ have become merchandisers. Just because you go somewhere and you buy a bit of merchandise and they put the head of Jesus on it doesn't make it holy and doesn't make it necessary. I get challenged because we're challenged as people. We're challenged to sort of get involved in culture wars and 
this virtual signaling where they do some little nice thing and sort of think that they're like, and say to you, my life's like that. When I hear and see big corporations take a, a uh, stand on something, it makes me nervous. Because, Cole, you know what? If they had their way, you and I would be working in a mine, pulling those railway carts by hand. There'd be no, there'd be no, um, no uh, uh, four-day weeks or five-day weeks. You'd be working daylight to dark in a mine that wouldn't be properly supported, breathing down the coal dust. And being, uh, and being left to die in an empty house somewhere. All the things that people have won by blood, sweat and tears. When the Spirit of God hit the Welsh mines, they couldn't understand, the pit ponies couldn't understand it because the miners were kind to them. They couldn't understand it. They forgot how to work. When, when people were flooding the church, when people were doing that, those days are coming again. The Spirit of God is coming like an ocean wave over his church. And all who dare stand will be drenched by his presence, will be activated. They'll know they have to take action. And I just feel like, see, we don't invite people to church because we don't think God will help them. I have prayed for over 10 autistic children that I've seen healed. You'd think this church would be full of autistic children. Flat out to get one to pay, pray for. Because people don't believe God will heal the last place people are going to go is for prayer. But I can tell you something. I must get Colleen to do it. If we were to just keep a note of the people we pray for on the prayer list here, the answered prayer, the miracles we've seen, remarkable. Remarkable. Because God does stuff. And the Christian church changed the whole shape of the world and these uneducated men, these disciples, changed the course of humanity and turned the world to Christ within just a few, within under a century. Under a century. In Luke 24 it says, And behold, I send the promise of my Father. Do you hear that? I send the promise of my Father. Go and wait, he said. Tarry in Jerusalem because you're going to receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. He didn't say you're going to receive the gift of tongues. They didn't even know what tongues were. You're going to receive power. Power. And when the Holy Spirit came, they start to hear, they start to hear them speak. And it says about all the races that were there at the place because of the feast. Because it coincides with a Jewish feast. When they came into the temple, the priests and threw water all over the place. When Jesus said, you'll drink the water, but you won't get thirsty again. In Matthew 3, John says, I baptise you with water unto repentance, but the one who comes after me, who is mightier than me, um, whose shoes I'm not even worthy uh, to, worthy to bear. 
He shall baptise you with the Holy Ghost and fire. This fire baptism. So many, much of the symbolism in the Bible is about fire. Floods and fire, floods and fire. I'm, I, I am a very lucid dreamer, right? So, and uh, I've, I've been going through a season of dreaming. It's like um, unbelievable, really. And uh, I've got to check myself in the morning that I'm not still in the dream. You know, when you wake up and you think, did that really happen to me? Well, that's been happening to me every day for months and months and months anyway. And, uh, and the, the, the dreams have been people have been attacking my house. I've been defending the house and I've realised that nobody's attacked the house, that God's looked after me. That's been lots of different framework to that. But I'm... I'm thinking today that in the mountains live about 80,000 people and uh, it's not a huge mission field, by the way. But do you know there has never been a church like this survive on the mountains. Past Springwood, forget it. Go all the way up. And I've, I've preached in churches at Lithgow. All the way up. I've preached in Bathurst a lot. All the way up. It's been littered with churches that have never been able to be dy- dynamic. They've been full of kind people and loving people and whatever. Because, you see, we've been placed in this occult place. We've been placed in this where we have people praying against us, praying for the failure of marriages, you know, praying sickness upon us, all this sort of stuff. And... God told me that we are meant to be a gate church to this mountains. And I'm there this morning and I'm watching this fashion parade of children that are being told that it's okay if you... And and what's happened is that lots and lots of young girls have been convinced that they're really boys. This is an assault on women, on the sacredness of a woman's womb, sacredness of her sexuality. And uh, in this literature I saw, I saw this morning, um, they don't call them girls. They call them people with... Um, Womb carriers and things like this. This is so derogatory. So terrible. And um, they, they, have a, they have waylaid us to vote. Who voted for same-sex marriage? Who would? Well, we all do. Lots of us would. Otherwise, it wouldn't have got in. And the next one they want us to vote on is another one where they pull the heartstrings. You know, where they sort of say, well, look what you've done to Aboriginal people. I've never harmed an Aboriginal person in my life. I don't even hardly know any. And the ones I've known, I've been kind to and I've liked and loved. You know? Colin and Susie have Aboriginal heritage. I don't think they've found they've been racially abused here. We value them. But let's not fall, fall for the free card trick. 
Antichrist thinking is on the rise. The beast is about to be revealed. We're about to enter the great tribulation. If you think times are tough now, you have no idea how tough they're going to be. We just, Tanya and I, watched a, uh, just a series called uh, This Little Light, which is the story of Anne Frank and her family. Profound. We should look at things like the Holocaust and know what we're capable of. Know what humankind can do. We need to know that we need to be constrained by the gospel. Empowered by the gospel. To be allow to allow God to flow through us. I'd like to pray with you all tonight. I want to pray. Um, now let's just see what we're going to pray for when we pray for it. Yeah. See, when we come, say they do the combined churches of the Blue Mountains, right? Don't think we get an invitation. We don't get an invitation to those things. Well, because we don't. I had one of the ministers, local ministers, come to my door and say, Are you saved? What? Anyway, I think that, and uh, I won't say any more. That'll get me in trouble. <laughs> With God, I don't care about people. But I want to pray for you because Peter and John, when they're at the temple, they bring the man who's lame to the temple. And they look at him and say, silver and gold we don't have. But what we do have, we give you. And what I do have, I'm going to give you tonight. 